Welcome friends and soon to be friends. This is your kind voice, the radio show where we interview inspiring guests about how they use their kind voices to make a difference in today's world. As always, I'm your smiling host, Dominic Damaski, the motivation champ. And today I'm honored to have on the show Ron Canserman and we're going to talk everything fireman. In our conversation today, we're going to discuss everything from the firefighting shows on TV to what makes these brave men and women jump into buildings and put their lives on the line to save others. Ron, I'm honored to have you on the show. Welcome. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Dom. I, I truly appreciate uh, the, the, the time that you're offering uh, the fire service to uh, join you this morning, and, and I'm glad to be on the line with you. And We've had some nice discussions on the side, and uh, I'm standing by, buddy, so just fi- fire away. And, and, uh, see All right, can, I'm going to uh, do it. Get so. the ball back. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to do it. Let's get into it. Number one, why do so many cats get stuck in trees? Is this is this serious, or do they really get stuck in trees all the time? All right. I'm going to put this back on you, Dom, and all your listening audience. Has anyone ever seen a skeleton of a cat in a tree? <laughs> Chances are the answer is no. So when your cat goes up in a tree, you don't need to call the fire department. They will come down when they're hungry. There is no record of a skeleton <laughs> of a cat ever, ever caught up in a tree. So we settle that one. <laughs> yes, thank you. Okay, now we're, we're going to get right into it. Do, I watch all these shows on TV. Uh, what is it? Chicago Fire. You ever watch Chicago Fire? I watched it once. Okay. Is is every fireman really the handsomest guy around and dating the prettiest girls? Myself aside? Um, <laughs> well... <laughs> Um, if you saw me, you'd be appalled. However, uh, well, I, th- there was a certain there was a certain faction of of, of uh, the female agenda out there that that is attracted to men in uniform, whether it's military, police officers, firefighters, and and so it's a natural attraction to a guy in a uniform, and it, and and it could be more so for firefighters because they, they you know they they do a lot of heavy work and they get dirty and and they're rough and tough and they're working out and. And they're in the gym and all that good stuff, you know, and they're saving lives. So uh, sometimes we, we, I, I'd say we might have the edge. It's not it's not 100%, but uh, I, I'd say we, we might have the edge there. So it's, uh, you know, okay. uh, I'm not sure we all look as good as the guys on television, you know, the guys that were on uh, uh, the show with Dennis Leary. I uh, can't think of the name of it right now, but, uh, uh, you know, it, I'm not sure we're all, we're all that good looking. But uh, I, we'll just say for the record, the guys do okay. Uh, all right. Thanks for clearing that up. Uh, let me ask on on that same uh, let's say avenue. I see I see on these shows and stuff like that that you guys have such a brotherhood. And being a I'm an outsider, I've never been a fireman. Is there is there really a brotherhood like that? There's there's no doubt there's no doubt that there is. The brotherhood runs very very deep. I will tell you, Dom, when 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 a firefighter gets killed anywhere in the United States. The rest of the, of the of the million firefighters around the country feel it. If a guy, we, you know, we get bulletins from all over the world. You know, three firefighters were killed last week, I think, in, in Iran or Iraq. Not not as a result of the war, um, and you feel it. And and a friend of mine said uh, we were talking recently. A fellow fire chief a few a few years ago, we were chatting about something about the brotherhood, and he was he was kind of complaining. That, that some of the guys, they just, you know, they buy a fancy T-shirt with a fire truck on it, and they say, yeah, I'm a member of the Brotherhood, but they don't really understand it. He said, if it's not in your bone marrow, you don't have it. And, and I, I, boy, I'll tell you, that, that, that rang with me. Uh, a, a quick story about the Brotherhood, Dom. I'll give you an example, and, and if, if, the, if the firefighters might be listening to this, they'll understand what I'm saying. And, and for, for your lay audience, this is what the Brotherhood is, folks. We had a firefighter gravely injured in the city of Camden, New Jersey, about 20 years ago, and he never recovered. And for 15 years, he needed surgeries, doctors, and his children were small. And the firefighters in that firehouse took his kids to school, mowed his grass, painted his house, <clears throat> and got them uh, and, and did everything they needed to do because he had four kids and, and mom was working. And the firefighters took care of that family until he died 15 years later. 15 years later, he passed away from his injuries sustained from that fire that, that he got caught in. And they took care of him, his wife, 
him. They took him to the doctor. They drove him to doctors and surgeries and all that, and his wife and his kids and, and his house for 15 years. That's the brotherhood. That's what we're talking about. Jeez. Now, what, what, what is, what's in your bone marrow that makes you a fireman? I, you know what? I, a lot of us have said that we believe it's a calling. You know, for, for me and for a lot of a lot of men and women out there in the United States, there's a little over a million firefighters in the United States, Tom. Uh, about three quarters are volunteers. Now, you put that into perspective. Here's three quarters of a million people that are volunteering to to, to kind of go in and put themselves in harm's way. So it's pretty pretty noble, you know. But when when you sit back and look at it for the most part it's i i believe it's a calling you know god god puts us on earth to do what we're supposed to do you know and 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 people become teachers and thoracic surgeons and uh, people have to have to we need plumbers and electricians and carpenters to build homes and make repairs and then he says you know what i think that this group of a million you're going to be firefighters and you need to take care of the community alongside the police officers and the ems people who Basically, that to ensure the safety and security of the community. So, I, I think you know you, you you end up doing it because you, you were supposed to, and that's that's my personal belief. And and most most of the guys I've talked to that I've talked to uh, have said the same thing. I, well, this is a calling for me. I, I'm, I'm supposed to be here. I belong here. You know, it feels right. So, I don't know how else to explain it. <laughs> no, it's it's, it's you you definitely it's it's me, and you're you're hitting me like I, I feel what you're saying. Is there is there a moment when you're out fighting fires, or once you're a fireman, you have the the suit, the badge, the helmet? Is there a moment where you say, "Yeah, I know this is for me. I made the right decision." I I, I think everybody everybody goes through that. Everybody has that. You know, I uh, for me, I, I was fighting brush fires and forest fires at 15, upstate New York, and and then. Uh, I lived in, in Brooklyn, and I, and I ended up working for the New York Fire Department eventually. But um, w- when I did that, I mean, at 15, I, I consider myself lucky. At the age of 15, after spending a couple of summers working in a, in a camp, in a, in a Boy Scout camp, I'm, I'm proud to tell you, and, and we formed up our own fire brigade to protect the camp. And the guys on staff, we had equipment, and, and we trained, and, and we, you know, if something happened, we were kind of ready, and, when I got back home after the third summer, I was 18, and I said, you know what? I think I like this. You know, so I, I kind of got bit by that bug early on, you know, and some guys, they don't get it early on. I've seen guys come through the fire academy in their late 20s and early 30s because I, had, I have a, a distant relative who was a stockbroker on Wall Street, and he was pulling his hair out. <laughs> and he took the firefighters test in New York City, and, and he took the job, and that was God. That's probably 28 years ago. And he's a lieutenant, and he's doing great. So sometimes it takes a while to to try something, you know. And that, that's really kind of what the fire training aspect is about, Dom. When you go to the fire academy to go for your training, that's that kind of separates those who will and those who won't, and those who can and those who can't, and all that stuff. And that's when you realize, you know, no, this this is me. This is me, and I, I need to do this, whether volunteer or career or otherwise. Uh, you start going through the training, and you say, well, no, no, I'm, I'm going to do this, uh, you know, the rest of my life. And you make that decision. How many people in that training, how many people say, well, I thought I was brave. I can't do this. Is it, is it training or is it the first day out on the job? When do you think it hits most people that it, I thought this was for me? But It's usually in the training academy. Very, 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 very rare occasion where you make it through your, your, all your, your training and then you get into the firehouse and you say, oh, wait a minute. I, I don't want to do this. I can't do it. And that's the exception to the rule. When you go through the training academy, if, and if the academy is run the right way, where they're going to make it as real and as tough as possible to, to prepare you for the street, then then that's where guys wash out. And, and on average, I mean, I'll just speak. Uh, I've been in Connecticut for six years, and, and the state of Connecticut Fire Academy, they run two classes a year, two recruit classes a year. And I'd say out of 35 in each class, you get two or three that just don't cut it. Uh, they, either, they either decide at that moment, this isn't for me, or the fire academy staff says, this guy's not going to make it, and, and if we push him through, he's going to hurt himself or somebody else, so we're going to have to take him out. So it's, it's probably, you know, three out of 30, so you, you're almost talking, you know, uh, that's 10%. Now, like two out of 30, three out of 30, 
there's been things in my life where maybe I said, hey, I, I can do it and it's not for me. And then you go and do something else and you're successful at it. What, how do you guys feel about, the firefighters feel about this guy? You know, day one, he's not a firefighter. And then what, how do you, what do you, how do you deal with it? It's, it's difficult. I mean, the, 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 you know, if you're talking personalities and attitudes, that, that's the toughest part to try to change. It's hard to change someone's attitude or personality. Uh, but it, 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 at the academy level, that, that's, for, that's where you're supposed to sort it all out. Now, if the guy gets through and then gets to the firehouse and everybody's looking at him like, where did this guy come from? How the heck did he get through school? Then it's, it, it becomes a, a burden, a little bit of a burden, because in, in the volunteer fire companies, basically – you kind of, as a member, you're at the mercy of, of the officers and, and maybe the fire commissioners, if there are any. And, 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 and even on the career side, if you come in as a paid man, you're, you're on probation for a year. And dur- during your probation, okay, if, if you're not, if you're not a, a snap tight Marine, you're going to be let go, whether career or volunteer. So there's always that one year probationary period where it gives, it gives the, the bosses and the rest of the gang a, a, a little bit of a tool and some breathing room to say, well, this guy doesn't seem like the real deal. If he proves himself over the next 10, 11 months, he could stay. And if he can't, we'll call him in and say, listen, you're not cut out for this. You know, go do something else. So we have a little bit of a of a uh, breathing room. All right, makes sense to me. Hey, Ron, Ron Canterman, we're going to take a quick break. And after after the break, we got a lot of stuff still to talk about. This is NASCAR driver Kurt Busch, and I am proud to support our nation's veterans. Do you know you can get a faster decision on your disability compensation claims by filing an electronic fully developed claim, or e-claim, on e-benefits? Take it from a guy who lives his life in the fast lane. Faster is better. Visit ebenefits.va.gov today to learn more. Hi, this is Corey from Runa. And at Runa, we make a number of different beverages, all from one leaf called Guayusa. Guayusa is a naturally caffeinated leaf from the Ecuadorian Amazon. Indigenous peoples in that area have been brewing and drinking it like tea for thousands of years. All the Guayusa that we sell is certified organic, fair trade, and non-GMO. And because Guayusa is naturally packed with caffeine and antioxidants, it gives you this really nice, clear-headed, clean, and focused energy. We think of ourselves as a lifestyle brand because Guayusa fuels you in doing whatever it is in your life that you need or love to do. So if it's one of those days where you need to sit at your desk for eight hours and pound out some some project or report, then Guayusa is perfect for fueling you and doing that work. Alternatively, if it's a beautiful day out and you're going to do yoga in the park or you're going for a bike ride in the woods, then Guayusa is perfect for fueling that as well. It gives you this amazing, full-body, wholesome energy and helps you feel fully alive. And that's why we call our company Runa. Runa is a Quechua word that actually means fully alive or fully living human being. We're sold in natural, organic food stores across the country. We're also in Whole Foods nationwide, and you can always find a store near you on our website with our store locator at runa.org. Go out to a store near you, grab a box or a bottle or a can, and crack one open and try one today. Welcome back to Your Kind Voice. Our program is part of a bigger mission at Your Kind Voice, which is to make our world a kinder, more connected place, one conversation at a time. Before the break, we were discussing all things firemen with Ron Canterman. We, we talked about We talked about the girls. We talked about their their braveness, we talked about their brotherhood. So I want to get back into it. Actually, we talked about the cats in the tree, too. But I want to get back into it. And on a serious note here, I want to say, ask Ron. You, you guys oh, yes, are so brave. Ahead. Okay. You guys are so brave. Is there a situation where, I mean, I'm sure you're going through them all the time. What's the scariest situation you've ever been in? Well, I, I, I'll tell you about being scared. You know, uh, if a, when a firefighter says to me or to, to anybody who's been around longer than 15 minutes, and I've been around longer than 15 minutes, uh, I'm not afraid. I worry about that guy because you have to have a little bit of fear. You know, when we go into a fire, it's an uncontrolled situation. It's Mother Nature being her absolute worst, okay? 
and it's an out of control situation and and we're we're trying to bring something completely out of control back into control again uh you have to be a little bit afraid uh we we, we preach uh, uh uh situational awareness is very very key uh for firefighters uh for for me uh it you know it's a it, it, typical fire uh, while while I was a fire chief in New Jersey I was running as a volunteer uh in my town in, in New Jersey and uh we got up in, into an attic space, and uh, things were kind of blowing around pretty pretty good, and, and it was it was scary. I mean, and, and it, there's, you know, it, and, and almost every fire, you know, you, you can't be afraid to go in. You can't be afraid to do the job, but you have to have that little inkling of, you know, uh, I, it can happen, you know. And, and so we, what we do is through training, through training and through, through th- programs and, Real life stuff, you know, and, and hands on training. We, we kind of give our guys every opportunity, every tool, every, um, uh, situation, every reality. Of, and, and that includes, like, you know, know how, before you go in, know how to get out. And, and before you go in, know how, know how, to, how to get out a second way. Because things happen. As, as well highly trained as you can be. And our guys are really highly trained. They, they that's what they do. Uh, you're going to get caught up in situations, you know, and and so that there's been there's been little things here and there. I, I've been on some hazardous materials calls where uh, we got some real methyl ethyl bad stuff, you know, it's fuming off, and and it's kind of going our way. The wind's in the right direction, and we're getting guys suited up to go in and and, and cap off of a, a rail car uh, with forty thousand gallons of acid in it, and the wind shifts on you, and and it's like. Huh. Just, we didn't expect, you know, and we're, and we're monitoring the weather. You know, generally you never get a 180 degree shift in the wind, for the most part, unless there's a hurricane are coming. So you, you always, we always set up upwind and uphill on, on that kind of on that kind of call. So you got the wind at your back for the most part, and it'll rarely come around 180. Well, Bing, it's in the middle of the summer, and here comes a, a, a thunderhead or a storm, and all of a sudden we've got acid fumes coming our way, and we got our command set, we got our command center set up, and everything else. So time to bail. So those are scary moments. And, and, and we're protecting, at the same time, we're trying to worry about our own people, and we're protecting the community at the same time. So you get into those scary moments, but, but we, we tell our firefighters, you've you got to be just a tad, a little bit afraid. You know, somebody come out with one of these, one of these wacky T-shirts, you know. We have, we have T-shirt guys in the fire service. You can, you can get a T-shirt that says fire on it, having to do with anything. And some wacky T-shirt guy, he come up with this big phrase, you know, I fight what you fear, and that, that's telling the average citizen, that, you know, you're afraid of fire and I'm not, and I'll go in and I'll take care of it. Well, you know, you, 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 don't, you don't have an S on your chest, big guy, and you don't have a cape underneath your, your, underneath your fire coat, okay? It, the fight, the, you're as vulnerable as the next guy. You're a little more protected, granted, but you're as vulnerable as the next guy, so you better be a little bit afraid, and that, that's kind of what we talk about. As, as a civilian myself, I guess if you're not a fireman, I guess you would call me a civilian. Is that correct? I, yeah. All right, so uh, we rather, we rather, Don, we rather refer to you as a customer, frankly. Okay, uh, as a customer, would, okay. could you give me some advice? I'm I'm a weenie, so could you give me and some of the listeners just in general how not to be scared? You guys overcome so much and put your your lives at risk. You have any tips for us on how not to be scared in? general situation. Well, well, first and foremost, first and foremost, we look at we look at public safety education. Okay, the, the the people the people of America need to educate themselves on on the hazards of fire. And that and that covers a whole gamut of like not storing propane in your house, which people do lately by the way. We had a couple of firefighters who get severely burned recently. Uh, someone was storing propane tanks in the house because they didn't want to leave it outside over the winter cuz uh, you know, I don't know what would happen to it. But uh, they had a house fire, and the tanks took off. And, and, and about 10 years ago, we had a, a deputy chief in New Jersey get killed when a, a propane tank in the house exploded during a house fire. So uh, stuff like that, you know, and, and just good public safety. Educate yourself. That, that's the, the most important thing because, for me, uh, educated public is a, is, equals a fire-free community. A fire-free community equals firefighters not getting injured and not getting killed. So I, I always I always uh, uh, kind of put on the same plane that fire prevention and public education equals less or no firefighter line of duty deaths. I'm I'm, a, I'm an advocate for that, and we'll talk about that later on. But 
Uh, so we, we, the best that you can do as, as a customer is, is educate yourself on the fire hazards, you know, inspect your house, do, do your spring cleanings, don't keep your flammables and combustibles in the house, uh, make sure your door between the garage and the house is snapped shut. Uh, that's a fire door. You don't want a car fire to get into the house. All, all those things. And you can get all that information from your local fire department. They'll be glad to give you literature. Uh, you can invite them to your house. Of course, we have no jurisdiction in private homes. But if you invite the, the local fire marshal or fire inspector, hey, come to my house, take a look around, they'll be glad to. And, and that's without punitive uh, action because they can't write a violation in a private house. So, so the best thing to do is, is educate yourself, understand how fire behaves and, and how you can prevent it in the first place. So to me, the best fire is a preventive fire. That, that's, that's my best uh, uh, advice. Makes sense to me. And uh, honestly, I think I have my propane tanks for my barbecue grill in my garage. Is that wrong? Uh, I would keep them out in the backyard. Okay, I, I learned something. Hey, yes. I think I got ADD. I think I have ADD, so I got to go back to something. And <laughs> you were talking. I asked you what was the scariest moment you've ever been in, and you were you were in an attic, and that's what I was hearing. And I just want to go back to that. And just is that is that correct? And tell me about it. Yeah, just basically you, you have limited access. You only have the attic door. And, and, and we're up, you're up there with a couple of guys and the fire's rolling around and, uh, you're making headway and now the roof of the building is getting weak. We hear some creaking and we're kind of in that limited confined space. And finally the officer says, you know what, we need to go. Because what happens is as much as, as, uh, situational awareness as you can have, firefighters tend to get a little bit of tunnel vision. It's, it's kind of like what we say, moths to the flame. And, and we're fixated on just trying to knock the fire out so it doesn't spread, it doesn't go, you know, to the next room or the next house. So you're up there doing your thing, and that's really what, what officers do is, is they, they, they should be watching, condi changing conditions, calling for more help, doing this. That, that's what the officer does while the firefighters are doing what they're doing. The officer's kind of watching four, four or five hundred different things going on. And, and then finally he taps us on the shoulder. He says, you know, we, we need to get out of here. Let, let's go. It's time to go. And then when we stopped concentrating what we're doing and looked around, you get that shiver down your spine like, wow, this could have been bad. We could have been trapped up here. It could have gotten worse. So, And now those are learning experiences. If you don't learn from them, then, then, then you're, not, you're not doing what you should be doing for your own self, for your own safety. Uh, firefighter safety is, has taken a front seat now for the last 10 or 15 years, and I'm out. We'll get into that a little later if you'd like uh, or whenever you want to. But And, and it's, it's tied into to, uh, to line of duties and all that kind of stuff. But that, th th those, those are scary moments. And, and you, you know, you, <clears throat> you only, you only a missed opportunity, you know, if, you, if you miss it, you miss it. You can't go back, you know. And if you don't learn from, from that, then, then you, you're shortchanging yourself and, and the people around you who are in there. I have a, a note here I wrote down while you were talking. I imagine... You can't save every house. You can't save every every cat. You can't save every person. Is how do you how do you guys handle that? And is that true? Or can you can you save everything and have you? How do how do you feel about that? No, you're you're right, Dom. We we can't save everything. We we do the best we we do what we can with our training and our tools and what's humanly possible uh, with the amount of people you have or don't have. You know, in in certain situations. Uh, let, let's say during the day when, when everybody's out of town going to work, you might only have three or four volunteer firefighters in the town, in a small town. Three or four guys can't do much. You know, I, I have a six-man shift, a, a career shift where I work now. I have a small career fire department. These guys are dynamite. They're, they're the most dedicated law people I've ever seen in a firehouse. They're great. Six guys on a shift, career guys, they get, they get, uh, they get paid. They work 24-hour shifts. But there's only six of them. They pull up on a house fire. You, you, you can do some things with six. You can't do everything. So even the biggest fire departments in the country, in New York City, Boston, Chicago, Los Angeles, they lose houses and they lose people, uh, Philadelphia, and they lose firefighters. You know, so we don't always win. We don't always win. And, and when we lose, when we lose, we take it pretty personal. You know, we take, I, for some reason, we take it personal. And even if it's not the loss of a firefighter, if it's a civilian, if it's a customer, you know, uh, they had a horrendous fire recently. I'm trying to think where it was, Dom, um, where a whole family was killed. It was three or four kids and, and mom, and th that the effect on on the firehouse, so other than the community and the, and the, and their family, the firefighters, boy, we feel that. 
We feel that. We we set we immediately set up. We have a critical incident stress debriefing teams all over the United States, and we call the the, the, the CISD guys right away and say, you need to get to our firehouse. Boy, we lost three kids tonight, or we lost two adults, or or whatever, because we we, t- we kind of take it personal because that's why we're here. You know, we based you know Dom the the, the the real simple the real simple way to say it is Mrs. Jones calls nine one one and she expects us to show up and get in between her and her problem, make her problem go away. That's kind of what we do. And when we can't make the problem go away or or say it turns really bad and tragic, we take it seriously. We take it to heart. You know, to, uh, it's it's tough. And then when it involves one of our own, it's twice as bad. It's it's real bad. When it's a customer, it's twice as bad when it's one of our own. So uh, we, you know, we, we we deal with it through. We end up uh, holding on to each other, uh, physically, emotionally. Uh, we get we get specialists in, and if a guy needs a little more counseling than others, we we send them, and we say go get you know kind of the old go get your head screwed back on straight and come back to work, you know, because we need you. And and that's that's been done thousands and thousands of times. Uh, we, we don't always win. And, and uh, that's just kind of the nature of the beast, I guess. You, you guys, you, the firemen as a whole, seem like a, a real metaphor for family, or you even are a family. I mean, just how you times get tough and you pull together and you get through things, sometimes bigger things, and just handle it. You lean on each other. I think I think I owe you. I want to give you. You mentioned safety a couple times, and I want to make sure I pay you the proper respect and. Right now, is there anything that's on your mind that you want to talk about? That just something. What is it? Well, you know what? I I, I think I, I appreciate that first of all, and and uh, we're going to call you from now on. You're going to be the host with the most. We're going to call you. That's your new name, the host with the most. Yeah, <laughs> Dom D. I'm on so, on it. On it. <laughs> uh, I want. I, I guess I want. I want the customers to understand that that we we've changed our philosophy. Um. Many, many years ago, uh, when I started, and a lot of guys started, you know, uh, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, and beyond, and back, you know, the, the crusty old guy in the firehouse put his arm around you, and he, and he said, hey, listen, by the way, in case nobody told you, we, we get hurt, we get injured, and we get killed, and it's all part of the job. Well, we've changed that philosophy. It's not acceptable. You know, any line of duty death is, is not acceptable. And, and with that, with that uh, I, I'm attached to a, an outfit called the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation. And, and their charter is, is to take care of the families of the firefighters who get killed in the line of duty. I've been with them about 15 years. We have an annual memorial service where we put the names of the year before, the names of the line of duties from the year before, onto a plaque at the National Memorial, which stands on the campus of the National Fire Academy in Emmitsburg, Maryland. For uh, you customers out there who don't know where Emmitsburg is, Emmitsburg, Maryland is right across the border from Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, and it was part of the war uh, the 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 war, the war that that happened around Gettysburg, uh, Emmitsburg was was all part of that. So it's right close to the battlefields. Uh, the the campus is actually an old an old girls Catholic school, and the federal government bought it in the seventies and created the National Fire Academy. And it's kind of in a, it's all West Point. It's advanced staff and command school and that kind of stuff. Uh, I've had the privilege to, to be teaching there for about twelve years. And and uh, that's where the monument stands, and we have our national memorial services the first weekend in October every year. Uh, in 2007, the president came and stayed for the whole thing, so it's a pr- it's a pretty big deal, and we, we honor kind of honor our war dead, if you will. Uh, and and uh, through that through that foundation, the people who run it, and and the, right now the executive director was a retired chief. He said uh, about 10 years ago, we've seen a lot of tears, and we, we've had a lot of grief here. We need to do something to counteract, and he took it by the horns, and and we they put programs, uh, national firefighter programs, in, in, into force that for ten years now on line of duty death prevention, and situational awareness, and and health and fitness is a big one. Fifty percent of our line of duties every year, Dom, is heart attack and stroke. So we're big into health, wellness, and fitness for firefighters and strategy and tactics and making good decisions, not just throwing yourself on the hand grenade, not just throwing yourself on the sword. You know, if the building's vacant, if it's empty, and there's no life hazard, you know, guys get, hundreds of guys have gotten killed in vacant buildings over the years. We're not doing that anymore. We tell our firefighters, there's no building worth your life. 
You know, so we're making good, better decisions. And, and if a building's empty or vacant, it's an empty, vacant building, and, and we'll hit it from the outside, and we all get to go home in the morning. And that's kind of what it's about. So there are some, because even, even the, the layperson, the average customer, has said, uh, you know, when there's been a line of duty, like, those two firefighters got killed. That, that was an old, empty, vacant building. What were they even doing in there? So it's obvious to the people who aren't in the fire service that we're doing silly things and getting our people killed. So we, we've really turned the corner. And we're doing a lot better, a lot better with that. And, and the programs are about 10 years old, and we've just got together recently to look at them. On the 10th anniversary, we, we convened in Tampa, Florida, and uh, we looked at all of it, and then we're redoing it again, and we're going to keep going until we get our line of duty numbers down. And they're coming down. We averaged for a long time through the 80s and 90s about 110 to 120 line of duty deaths a year in, in, in the United States. And, and it was coming down into the 70s recently. And then, of course, last year we had, we had uh, two horrendous tragedies. Uh, Nineteen firefighters were killed in, in Prescott, Arizona, in the wildland, and ten were killed in an explosion in Texas at a fertilizer plant. So that, that kind of that put 29 people right back on, on the memorial. Uh, without that, it would have been in the low 70s. So it kind of bumped us up near 100, over 100. So uh, we, we are trying. We, we want the people out there to know that, that you know, we're going to do everything humanly possible to get you and your family and, and, and even your pets most of the time out of the house. But as far as the house goes, we'll do everything we can to save your house. But sometimes we're not going to sacrifice a firefighter for a house. It's not what we're, it's not what we're about. That's kind of what we're teaching now. Ron, I think you're saying something that we can all understand here. And, you know, you guys are doing so much to help us. And if there's, if there's anything on the same uh, point, you know, is there anything we can do to help you as firefighters? Well, you know what? The National Fallen Firefighters Foundation, and, and their, their website is, is uh, firehero.org, firehero.org. Um, they have, we have a new program now, and, and it's called Be a Hero, Save a Hero. And it's really apropos to our conversation this morning, Dom. I'm glad you asked me. And what that is, it's kind of what I alluded to earlier in the conversation. Uh, is be a hero, save a hero, is you as a citizen can be a hero by doing good fire prevention practices, getting education, cleaning up the house, you know, and all that stuff. And the saving the hero part is now you're not going to have a fire and, and you're not going to put a firefighter in jeopardy for uh, a, a silly reason like, you know, not taking care of your home and, or, or, you know, that kind of stuff. So it, what it is, it's, it's a program to make the public kind of a, a community awareness program to make the public more aware on how to take care of themselves, how to prevent a fire, so we don't put a firefighter at risk unnecessarily. We know fires are going to be accidental. They're going to happen. You know, somebody said years ago, the three main cause of fire in America are men, women, and children. So hmm. we know due to human error, there's going to be fires, and, and we stand by to respond to those fires, okay, for, um, uh, I guess I guess we can call it uh, the normal daily Everyday accident, if you will. Okay, but what, what we what we we're going to come no matter what. I mean, I, I guess that we should say that first. We're coming no matter what. However, um, if we can lessen the amount of fires and and put less people at risk, you know, when, when we come in, we're putting ourselves at risk. But but we kind of signed up to do that. But we're also dressed in the proper clothing, and we have we have breathing air on our back. You know, uh, we're, we're going to do a little bit better crawling around inside your house than you will without breathing air on your back and without fire gear on, on, on your body. So this is all about protecting yourselves and us at the same time. It's, for us, it's a win-win. So you can go to firehero.org and go to uh, Be a Hero, Save a Hero, and you can see how you can start a, a movement in your community to have less fires, less anguish, less agony, less tears, less injury, less death. And in turn, that kind of helps the firefighters of America stay safe. Um, sounds like a great cause. Ron, I want to thank you for being a guest on the show today, firehero.org. Before we go, last last thoughts, anything you want to say to the listeners? Well, just that uh, I, I appreciate being on with you. Uh, if, if you have a regular listener group, uh, they're, they're fortunate that they found you because I, I, you're a stand-up guy and, you're, and, and the kind of work you're doing here on Blog Talk Radio is terrific. I have a Blog Talk Radio show myself. 
uh, is through Fire Engineering Magazine, myself and Tommy Ehrenhammer from Colorado. We call ourselves the Backstep Boys because when we started 35 years ago, we were riding on the backstep of a fire truck. And I guarantee you, you're not going to see that anymore because that's a safety issue. Everybody rides inside the cab now buckled up. So we call ourselves the Backstep Boys. We talk about firefighter safety and survival and uh, I'm, yeah, also on Blog Talk. But other than that, Don, we appreciate the fact that, that you thought enough of, of the American firefighters uh, to put us on this morning with you. So we can tell a little bit of our story and, and reach out to the community and, and uh, hopefully make them safer as well as ourselves. Thank you, Ron. You have a good day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. If you'd like to be a guest on our program, please go to www.kindvoice.org backslash guest-information and tell us about how you use your kind voice to make a positive impact. After talking to Ron today, I have one thing to say, you know, I could, I could drone on about this or that, but Ron and the firefighters in the country and the world are true heroes. They are really what your kind voice is about. These are guys just giving back. They're giving everything they have, sometimes even their lives, to help other people. And this is really, I'm honored, I'm humbled to have somebody like Ron Canterman on the show today doing what he's doing. I ask our, our listeners to... Support firehero.org. Check those guys out. They're doing great things. I'm Don McMaskey, the Motivation Champ. If you'd like to have me come speak at an event or purchase my book, Don't Double Bread the Fish, you can check me out at motivationchamps.com or my book's available at amazon.com and barnesandnoble.com. I always say this each time before we leave, and I'll say it again today. If you get knocked down, get back up and keep swinging. Choice to be a kind boy.